Alright, bonjour tout le monde, un autre livre, another one, yes, so uh, today's book is The Mainspring of Human Progress, Henry Grady Weaver. Alright, this was another one of the books on the bibliography, um, or recommended reading, from uh, Neil Nash's book, um, Become Your Own Bank, so that led me to this one, as well as the last two books before this, prior to this, the uh, pension idea and uh, Richest Man in Babylon and the law. Well, I guess there's four all together. This will be the fourth one. Um, but uh, so I came from this from a very particular standpoint, a very particular focus, trying to get uh, a better understanding of financial things and a financial perspective and all that. And that's very important here. Very important because I really feel like this book uh, brought about a sort of evolution of thought. Like there is some transformation going on. Um, all right, so it was published in uh, let's see, published in 1953, copyright 1947. So let's just say 1950-ish time period, right? So of course, every time I'm reading something, I'm trying to put it in the context of what the people who were, uh, what was going on around the people who, around the author what's going on in their life, what's happening in the time. So, who they were, you know, who am I talking to, basically? Who am I listening to? Okay, the author in the book, Henry Gr Grady Weaver, was born in Eatonton, Georgia, December 24th, 1889. Received his BS from Georgia Tech in 1911. He held a series of jobs in various phases of the automobile industry until 1921. So, time period, of course, man. And location, Eatonton, Georgia, What's going on in Edenton, Georgia in the 1890s? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty bad for people who look like me, right? Pretty bad. Um, in the summer of 1919, uh, you know, the red summer, a lot of stuff went down. They burned churches and, and uh, businesses or churches and homes. They burned down a whole lot of stuff in the summer of 1919 in Edenton. And of course, none of the people were charged or brought to justice because that's how it went back then um you did things did things to african americans or former enslaved people or and you never brought the prosecution so um that was normal so who knows some of his family could have been a part of it you know but it didn't matter that one brought to justice um <clears throat> okay <clears throat> but that's him and then georgia tech uh i was gonna look up that school to see what the uh kind of um, demographics were, like who were there, but you, I mean, come on, 1911. So then uh, he went, jobs in the automobile industry. So he was, that was the year he went with General Motors. So General Motors, think about, um, and he became a customer research staff, head of the customer research staff. All right, so General Motors, I was looking at in um, Detroit, very small percentage but that's right around the time it started to boom um so as far as boom for the automobile industry as well as bringing in jobs <clears throat> for african americans and stuff like that and that was up to like eight percent african americans or something like that point eight to four percent i think very small sliver but we was in that convinced that human liberty human liberty is the mainspring of progress so what are we talking about mainspring of human progress we're talking about human liberty um, and that government tends always to tyranny he decided to popularize these themes for the american people so i felt like this book is probably has more to do with um the same things i've been reading about this kind of libertarian kind of bend toward human liberty which is a new vocabulary word for me but i'll explain why i know that now but uh yeah, so I expect this to be in line with the last couple of books I wrote. I mean, the last couple of books I read because um, they're also critiquing the government and its function. And yeah, so, so let's see. In an author's notation, quote, author's notation in the first printing of the book, Mr. Weaver states, in some respects, respects mainspring is a condensation of Ross Wilder Lane's book, The Discovery of Freedom. So I looked her up, and she's the daughter of the woman who wrote um, the, oh man, now what's the name of that series? Uh, the ser um, Prairie, Life on a Prairie, uh, 
Oh man. Anyway, uh, so that put a perspective into uh, Little House on the Prairie. That's what I'm talking about. Um, that series. That's her mom, and that's something I grew up at least reading about. Even though I don't remember the stories, but I know that it was, you know, <laughs> Little House on the Prairie is like everybody else is gone, but us. How are we making it? This is our life and these are our relationships. No black people involved for real. <laughs> you know. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Um, okay. So, chapter one. Now, I'm talking about the evolution of understanding here. So, this, this really did it for me. I learned a lot. On the financial front, a little bit. <laughs> Which was the point, right? Uh, chapter one. And this is obviously 200 roughly 208 pages but really the book stops at like 230 and uh so i okay for 60 known centuries this planet that we call earth has been inhabited by human beings not much different from ourselves so 6,000 years i was like all right here we go now this is the 40s this is a person who works at general motors and this is a person who's really summing up another book but their perspectives are already starting to shape in my head just from the first line i was like well i don't know but i'm looking past these things because i actually came to this book for a purpose and i think that makes a really key difference i'll explain it more then suddenly in one spot on this planet planet people eat so abundantly that the pangs of hunger are forgotten where is this place one spot on the planet people eat so abundantly uh, oh Oh, yeah, they, they were talking about here in America that suddenly one spot on the planet, people suddenly uh, are able to eat like most people were dealing with fam <clears throat> famines and the civilizations that were thriving closer to the equator and stuff. No, that doesn't. That's not a part of this narrative. And I was thinking this isn't a historian saying this stuff. Um, so. In regards to it being about history, I'm going to take all that with a grain of salt. That's not their specialty. This guy got a bachelor's of science at Georgia Tech, and he works at General Motors, and he's talking about somebody else's book. So don't give me a history lesson right now, okay? That's what I was thinking. <clears throat> Surface, the forces of nature are harnessed to do the bidding of the humblest citizen. Um, okay. We in America take floors rugs chairs tables windows and chimneys for granted uh so yeah yeah why did men women and children eke out their meager existence for six thousand years toiling desperately from dawn to to dark barefoot half naked unwashed unshaved uncombed with lousy hair mangy skins and rotting teeth and i was just thinking okay we're talking about certain people here obviously because the thriving civilizations of mankind weren't that way okay Let's keep going. Um, we have moved from back-breaking drudgery into the modern age of power, substituting steam, electricity, and gasoline for the brawn of man. Um, standards of living. Let's see. But new ideas are of little value in raising standards of living. Okay. Extending the benefits of inventions and discoveries to the vast majority of people in all walks of life. So really I was just thinking about okay he he's talking about standards of living but that's something that we have come up with now that it's not a term that was ever used these kind of standards of living it was a, a it just stuck out to me and uh, yeah okay so anyway how did it how did it come about how can it be explained just what has been responsible for this unprecedented burst of progress which has so quickly transformed a hostile wilderness into the most prosperous and advanced country that the world has ever known so now i'm like okay this is america he's talking about and it was a hostile wilderness and now it's an advanced country okay so there's this leaning there's this narrative about what was here before and it's that it was a hostile wilderness is it is it because we work harder? Again, the answer is no, because in most countries, um, the people work much harder on the average than we do. I'm sure I highlighted that because he didn't prove it. Um, he just 
throws out these these statements about life everywhere else, but it's not following any kind of um, extensive proof or test of validity or ver- veracity. Can it be that we are a people of inherent superiority? That sounds fine in after dinner oratory and goes over big at election time. Now he's obviously talking about people who identify as white, obviously. Because who else is going to be having these after dinner oratory and uh, speaking about it at election time? Okay. But the argument is difficult to support. Our own ancestors, including the Anglo Saxons, so now he's making it very concrete. He knows who his audience is. It's not people who look like me. Okay. Have starved right along with everybody else. So I was really becoming a little sad. I was coming a little sad that this wasn't that this wasn't written for me, right? Um, and I'm and I'm getting that more and more. But at the same time, I know why I was reading this. I was reading this to learn more about to change my perspective. And I thought of Nelson Nash isn't isn't racist. You know, he's he's not a racist person. He's he's brought on a lot of imaginative ideas and he's thinking outside the box. And I'm like, that's what I'm trying to get from this. So <laughs> so if he's not racist, then surely he wouldn't put on he wouldn't be recommending books written by people who are racist. And then but I'm really focused on getting through the book now. OK, and, and it gets good. OK, <clears throat> have made more effective use of our human energies than have any other people on the face of the globe anywhere or at any time. Now, who has made more effective use of their human energies? I can't help but say uh, only the people who were free from the what did he call it the drudgery um anyway okay in fact life is energy i was like, okay we're talking about energy i love energy uh but yeah it didn't leave me much there individual freedom is the natural heritage of each living person such a crazy thing um and they're talking about freedom over and over again at a time when people weren't given that freedom, right? So, control simply can't be separated from responsibility. Control is responsibility. So I'm I'm looking hard for these little tidbits to hold on to. Um, very similar to Think and Grow Rich, because even though I would hear things that didn't necessarily make sense in the context of people who look like me in the time that it was written, I'm like, well, he's talking about general principles, so. And they relate more now in, in this time period than they did when he wrote it. So I can take more from it now than people who look like me could take from it then. Um, so I was like, all right. Uh, to make the most effective use of human, human energy, it is necessary to reckon with the nature of man. Okay. In the last analysis, oh, I turned green. It's important. In the last analysis, a thing is not property unless it is owned. And without ownership, there is little incentive to improve it. And okay, here's one of those grandiose statements that are just supposed to be true. And it's like, this is the thing about certain books and the way they write is that they'll speak in these truths, like these, this, this, it's a common truth sort of statement, a kind of aphorism, right? Um, where it's not based on anything other than what they said a little previously, but, but it's not like something that's been passed on through sages, through wisdom, ancient all the way up to today no it's just they just reach a conclusion and, and acts like it's just truth in general it's presented like a general fact or something a thing is not property unless it is owned and without ownership there is little insensitive incentive to improve it without ownership so only will i try to improve my child's life because i feel like i own them or only will I be charitable and just try to help build something for someone else um, because I own it. Like, no, it doesn't make sense across the board. Oh my goodness. But this stuck out because I'm like, I can expect more of this. It's already happening early in this book. Okay, the American Economic Foundation, this is the great multiplier, puts it in terms of the mathematical equation mmp equals nr plus he times t which is just a shorthand way of saying that man's material progress depends on that's the equals (laughs) uh natural resources 
plus human energy multiplied by tools. What a waste of mathematics. And this dude has a BS. Um, <laughs> but uh, that is how e equations are, you know, framed and shaped and relationships are established between different things. Yes, I get that. But you hear them trying to uh, create. Here he is trying to create this thing. And like this follows right in line following World War II and a lot of physics theory and, and Einstein and Oppenheimer and, and um, uh, you know, Man, Lawrence equations. I mean, it follows in the history of mathematical theories that that's how you should start out. You start in a discourse and then you bring up an equation. So yeah. Um, but oh my God, it's like all right. Never mind the accuracy of the relationship, but goodness. So anyway, um, and without the tools of production, human beings would sink back into a state of barbarism. We have moved a long way from the Stone Age, and today everyone depends for his welfare, for his very life, upon exchanges of ownership. So here's the model that he's speaking about, uh, that it is only through these exchanges of ownership that uh, we have what we have. We're able to live the way we do <clears throat> without the tools of production. Human beings were saint, as if there was nothing before this economic model before colonization you know everything before colonization is like well are you going to mention it and that's a big thing about this book is what they say as opposed to what they don't say what they leave out counter arguments no um okay but all right let's go we drink coffee at breakfast because brazilians need our iron machinery and wheat and japanese babies grow strong and healthy when american women buy silk lingerie now this is like, for me, uh, saying that imperialism and colonization and forcing trade on nations, forcing relationships, and at the at gunpoint um, is good. This is human progress. So the the ends verify the means, right? That's what's going through my head, and they speak to that. This is the kind of world in which men and women naturally want to live. Naturally, really. And it is the kind of world they begin to create when they are free to use their individual energies and are free to cooperate among themselves voluntarily. That is not how the system even came about. It did not come about on these people voluntarily. Look at the history of Japan and how America forced themselves over and over and over again. Um, look at America. How? I, I, oh, okay. But... The interesting thing about me reading this was that I wasn't resentful, and I'll explain more about that because uh, that resent is is what was keeping me from moving forward. And like I said, when I read the Richest Man in Babylon, I was going to leave that resentment alone, and um and I see that evolution here because I'm able to just kind of see where people are coming from. And initially, I was thinking, well, maybe they, you know, are um. Uh, he is the author is is trying he, he doesn't want to speak out about certain things because the way it will look but that's no 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 that's not how it looks that's not how it looks today okay do unto others as you would have them do unto you is not only a sound moral precept it is also the hard-headed advice of practical self-interest whoever injures another injures himself hmm. how can we reconcile the principles of cooperation with the conflicts of competition so what was important there is that he didn't want to reconcile the principle of cooperation with the conflicts of slavery, with the conflicts of war brought in America. He's talking about competition. So there's a very certain perspective um, going on here. Uh, and I have realized that I've taken for granted the awareness that a lot of people have today in regards to what's going on in the world around them and uh, I'm now encountering more people who put things into a global context and historical context as opposed to people who write the way history has been written where you ignore all of these things going on that have been going on and are going on because you only want to talk from a certain perspective with no regard with no regard to what else is happening 
And that's what this book reminded me of. Okay, of course, different individuals have different views as to just how things ought to run, but the idea persists that there should be a unified control. Again, in this model that they're framing, that would be true. Okay, but not for everybody. I'm using the word religious in this broad sense, but I think it can be shown that any form of human organization, whether it be political, commercial, or social, reflects the deep-seated faith of the people who organize it and keep it going. Now, that I absolutely believe. Um, any form of human organization uh, reflects the deep-seated faith of the people who organize it and keep it going. 100%. Um, how do they affect the uses of human energy? What are the results in terms of progress, spiritual as well as material? What do these three religious views mean to you and to me as bearing on the present and the future? Now, remember, he's already established who he's talking to, this you and me. And um, what I began to see is that this is why it's so hard. That's why it was so hard for me to enjoy history early was because everything about that I was learning from history because I wasn't really learning it at home so when I was learning at school the hardest thing is that I didn't see myself in it it didn't relate to me I couldn't relate to it and this is just that type of book and he's made it clear that it didn't have to do with people like me so I felt ignored you know off the top and um but I didn't want that to stop me from gaining something right and that's hard you know that's what made me a good student growing up was that I didn't want to let anything stop me, even if people being racist. I didn't want people to stop me from, uh, I didn't want to be stopped from gaining something from it, from, from learning something. Um, but my, my understanding of what racism was, I didn't really understand it. So I, I didn't really allow myself to get resentful because I didn't understand the forces going on around me. But once I started to learn, I became really, really resentful. The more I learned, the more resentful I became. And I wanted to put the guilt on the people. I wanted to blame white people for their racism. I wanted to blame them, you know. And uh, it went from that to, well, I don't want to blame anybody. I don't want to blame anybody for racism. It's wrong to blame people. Um, and then I became more, uh, the self-hatred came back. Well, now I want to blame myself for it, like uh, for, or, or my family history or the culture in, in the South, I want to blame all that for it. You know, I want to blame, put that blame. Ah, ah. I want to reconcile these feelings. Um, and then, anyway, fast forward. The evolution now is like, I can see the same thing in someone, let's say, that was locked up or the prison industrial complex, right? They're going through terrible things in prisons, terrible things, inhumane conditions, treated less than human. Right. Just like the people who are enslaved, just like racism, discrimination feels like a lot of times something other than you're not treating me equally. That's how they're being treated on a on a daily basis. Now, they get out of prison. They've been in for 20, 30 years. They get out of prison. A lot of people have so much resentment. They can't function out here. And I can easily see myself as an enabler of that prison culture. Why? Not because I look at, um, I treat people who have committed a crime a certain way. I don't treat them any differently. I don't engage with them very much. I try to separate myself from people who have the potential to commit these crimes. I try to distance myself from the whole thing. Now, the point is, I'm enabling it because I'm trying to ignore it the same way these people who wrote this book are ignoring all this stuff going on around them. They're just creating distance. Why bring up prison when I'm trying to talk about economics, about the financial system? It doesn't even make sense. Their problem is not the problem we're addressing here because I'm not trying to uh, solve their problems. That's their problem. If they wouldn't be who they are, then they wouldn't have their problem. But that ain't my problem. Like it's it's the same mindset to separate myself from people in prison right now, as these white people try to separate themselves from people who are racially discriminated against and oppressed on a daily basis right around them, right? So how can I judge them and not judge myself? So this racism thing goes deep um, because same way that I can hear white people say like, 
oh well when i try to think about uh um when I realize all this stuff, you know, makes me uncomfortable, you know, the whole CRT argument, they shouldn't feel guilty, da da da. Well, I could say the same thing about learning all the different ways with someone in prison and it has been in prison, they can explain to me how my lifestyle is perpetuating the problems that they have to deal with. Absolutely they could. I don't even understand those ways because I feel like I'm so separated from it. How could I have anything to do with those problems that you have to endure? And there, and then there's the element that these people are traumatized, man. If you've been locked up, they call it institutionalized, right? If you've been locked up for decades upon decades, your chances are slim that you can leave all that stuff at that institution when you get out and then be a functioning member of society. The same way that generations upon generations of people who have been discriminated against racially, they're traumatized. It's a, it's a, it's less likely for them if they've been deep in the trauma or in the deep south to get out of that a lot do more now probably but there are so many things from emotional to systemic in your family to financial never having a leg up to i mean it's just on and on and on but then to be able to let go of all of that and <laughs> not hold resentment not hold resentment to everybody who hasn't had to deal with that you would think everybody's a problem you know so anyway i can see myself in this author in that way and that is an evolution because my resentment toward them is gone. But the facts still remain. You know, the ignorance is still there. And that's really what it boils down to, ignorance. Um, chosen or not, it's ignorance. Um, how do they affect the you? Okay, let's keep going. So that was pretty much the big thing right there. Um, but there's a lot more in this. <laughs> okay. The Pagan View. I was like, all right. So what this book turned out to be is a long ass history book um, <laughs> that uh, uh, follows the same kind of um, blueprint that history books follow when I was little. Same thing. And I was shocked. And again, I'm reading this for financial um, gain, for financial understanding, gaining in that perspective. There were sun gods, love gods, gods of jealousy, gods of hatred and gods of war whimsical and prankish gods looked after everything all that man could do was to keep pace with them by making such sacrifices human and otherwise as were dictated by tribal custom who are the people he's talking about is he, is he just talking about the aztecs like I, I think he brought up uh one thing but it's just like you're throwing out stuff but you're not a historian man don't just all that man could do and of course he's not addressing egypt but you know from the pagan viewpoint, man is not self-controlling, not responsible for his own acts. The pagan universe is timeless, changeless, static. So he's really um, creating these definitions. Um, he's saying what the pagan has a fatalistic outlook on life. That's not so. And again, this is what it looks like when they group everything that's not Christian as pagan. Um, because... That's really how it's, you're not given a history. This is the history that a lot of Americans were given. This is the, this is just echoing that whole thing. So that's what I was beginning to see. Yet throughout all history down to and including modern times, few adult persons have ever discovered that they are really free. And yet there is still some truth. <laughs> um... Most human beings cling to the ancient superstition that they are not self-controlling and not responsible for their own facts. Really? Really? No, because when you look at the uh, the book of the coming forth by day or the book of the dead, which was the precursor to the Ten Commandments, of course, um, you are confessing that you have not done these things. You have not done these things because that's what's going to bring you in a good standing into your afterlife and that is completely against saying that you are not self-controlling i mean it says in egypt above the temples know thyself like you are supposed to be in control of yourself and you're supposed to understand what forces could control you you go to uh hinduism buddhism and how you have these competing forces and this dualism and it's your job to seek this balance it's your job to seek this balance so you're given techniques to seek this balance so you can be in unity with the world around you you are empowered at every turn in all these ancient belief systems so no ancient superstition that they are not self-controlling based on what 
Oh, man. But those are the kind of conversations that could come in, but that's not what it's written for. It's not written for everybody. It's written like he said, you and me, our ancestors. This is a very Eurocentric text. And this is how it comes across. And they can make it seem like it's world history because that's what this is, right? This is history of the world. We're just not thinking about certain parts of the world. <laughs> and that's why people can say, oh, I've taken years of history and world history, but I didn't know anything about that. It's because your education was Eurocentric, but they will never label it as such. Why does one person want to meet another person? What is the human purpose in society? Um, it is to exchange one good for another. Oh, one good for another good more desired. He said that is the purpose in human society. What? Putting it on a personal basis, it is a matter of benefiting yourself by getting something you desire from another person who at the same time benefits himself by getting something that he desires from you. The object of such contacts is the peaceful exchange of benefits, mutual aid cooperation for each person's gain. Now, there's a spiritual element, of course, that the people that is just disregarded, discounted, not mentioned. That's not the way you see it. Society, and again, this is coming from somebody who worked at General Motors. You know, capitalism and, and exchange is a big part of his thinking. But you can see how spirituality is not. But this is produced, this is generated like something that's just nonpartisan, non affiliated, just, you know, the motivations behind it will be lost because you think you're just reading history. <clears throat> the real human world is made by persons, not by societies. The only human development is the self development of the individual person. There is no shortcut. Um, so a lot of this is uh, kind of trying to reinvent the wheel. There have been plenty of discussions of philosophers, thinkers, who explain persons versus societies. And for, for them to make another broad statement like this is just, it's, it's telling. The only human development is the self-development of the individual person now i can see a little truth in it but i mean you just use words like that oh that's how people put their foot in their mouths a lot teaching you how to put your foot in your mouth almost all of us at some time or another have harbored the pagan belief that the sacrifice of the individual person serves a higher good <laughs> pagan belief sacrifice serves a human good now this is also with no discussion of what slavery has looked like because that is an argument they would make to the enslaved person that it is for it serves a higher good that's why you're sacrificing all of your time for nothing sacrificing everything because it's serving a higher good and that's what slavery has done for us it's it served a higher good we wouldn't we wouldn't have what we have had it not been for them now that goes against just that mostly factual account that i just said goes against um it being a pagan belief that the sacrifice of the individual person serves higher good it's like insert foot in your mouth because you're saying that you're that what we have now has been based on that and in, in in one respect it's just okay so anyway <clears throat> she points out that the most uh she points out that most of the major ills of the world have been caused by well-meaning people who ignore the principle of individual freedom except as applied to themselves most of the major ills of the world well-meaning people and there were good people on both sides who ignored the principle of individual freedom except as applied to themselves i was thinking okay here comes some self-critique of what we're in because why not bring in what's going on in the world you who are from eatonton georgia who see this on a daily basis <laughs> but no the direct quotations and specific references using this book are numbered consecutively and the sources are listed. So I was excited. I was like, oh, he has a bibliography because up until for a lot of this, there were no annotations. Yes, there were a few quotations, but I was like, this doesn't even have references. How is he proving anything? And when are we going to talk about finances? You know, um, 
It is based on this idea. I am right. Those who disagree with me are wrong. If they cannot be forced into the line, they must be destroyed. Mm -hmm. The danger lies in the fact that their faith is just as devout and just as ardent as that of the ancient Aztec priest. So now it's just going to bring in Aztec priests. Like the way that they just kind of throw in bits of history that you, I mean, should be proven or disputed or good references given um, shows that it's just, it's one of those texts like, guy, stick to your profession, right? But this was recommended, it's recommended reading from Neil Nash. So I'm like, Let, let's go. And I'm less resentful of all that. I'm just aware of the different biases and the different um, dynamics going on. Okay, socialism and communism. I was like, here we go. The nearest approach to the bee swarm is found in socialism or communism, whichever term you care to use. There is not much choice between the two. They both aim at world collectivism. Bing, bing, bing. I was like, that's why he recommended it. Aha. Because this guy is in line with um, the other, the law, the, um, and he even mentions Frederic Bastiat and um, the pension idea. And so I looked into the lady who he's quoting the book that this is, I guess, condensing or summarizing that he says. And she is a um, libertarian. And that was new to me. But that's what that, that's what it's all about. This libertarian idea. So his references, he's... Neil Nash recommended this because of that bend, that bend of understanding toward um, uh, speaking against socialism, communism, or collectivism. That's it right there. All this other stuff, I would imagine he would say something like, you know, well, I don't necessarily agree with this and that. I don't necessarily agree with this and that. But when it comes to individual responsibility that's where he's that's where these all these texts are lining up okay ah there he is frederick bastiat so i was like aha that's the link man that's the link he, he's talking about the french economist and uh so yeah but bastiat was no my no match for the highly organized proponents of class hatred and he was defeated at the polls in 1848 exhausted by overwork and robbed of his voice by tuberculosis tuberculosis he continued to fight until his death in 1850 at the age of 40 oh, 49 the carrying on of his work should be a challenge to some freedom loving american of the younger generation so i was beginning to see that you know man it's so sad to me that people can actually fight for good ideas and at the same time be blind to the hypocrisy of their fight when they don't address other things in their own society and i'm talking about myself when it comes to criminal justice reform and how i can be all for a lot of stuff in my life but i don't include their fight that we have the largest incarcerated population on the planet but i don't address that in my daily life but i still want to fight for other things that are um, similar to what they're going through, but I'm still ignoring their struggle because it doesn't affect, because they don't affect me, because they're invisible to me. They've been invisible. So I, I, I'll fight for criminal justice reform in the way that, I don't know, the state will come down on me over a parking ticket and we shouldn't have to pay this and that and and I, I shouldn't have to go to all the way to court and, and it'd be put off and blah, 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 and I shouldn't have to. And it's like for the person who's in prison, like you don't even know the half of it, but you don't care about me, sir. You're worried about your freaking parking ticket. But I'm over here in jail over the same corrupt system when I shouldn't even be here in the first place. Like I can only, I'm so focused on myself that I'm putting out everything else. And that's what it looks like for, for me, when like uh, someone who identifies as black or or would be identified as black, when they make the argument like trying to insert history into something like this, trying to call the people racist for not speaking about it like they should know it or that they're ignoring it, um, it's like pointing to myself, man. So I can't do that anymore because I'm doing the same thing when it comes to other issues that are facing the world. So I don't believe these people are racist. I say all that to say I don't believe they're racist the effects of their ignorance 
of their ignorance perpetuates systemic racism like that's how systemic racism works and that's how the prison industrial complex continues to expand and people get jobs in prisons and don't feel bad about it like yeah i'm i'm glad they built their prison and brought jobs because i didn't have one sucks for them that's um in prison but i'm just a worker here and i need a job it's it's things that perpetuate the whole complex um and not having ways to address it to talk about it that's a big part of the problem like this this text the way i'm talking about it now they wouldn't want to have this conversation with me everybody would get uncomfortable because it's not the way to learn it (laughs) they're like no no no, you're missing the point well what is the point the point is that this is the greatest country in the world (laughs) but there's really no difference uh no distinction between the socialists and the communists except from the standpoint of tactics and getting started i can agree with that they questioned me shrewdly i staggered myself by mentioning taxes i had to admit that an american pays the tribe for possession of a house this seemed to concede that the American tribe does own the house. I was routed. Wait a minute. Um, yeah. So this is just going back to the argument about taxes and inflation and how the government is creating a more of a um, dependent citizenry and taking more ownership via taxes and um, via inflation. Okay. When a communistic community is set up alongside a community with a free economy, the contrast is too great to be ignored. Any attempt to govern the actions of multitudes of men always results in oppressive power being placed in the hands of a few. Under communism, everything is run by the masses, at least at least that's the theory of the thing. But in actual practice, it doesn't work out that way. There must be some strong person or small group of persons to sit in the saddle and eliminate any ideas that are opposed to the so-called common good as determined by the strong person or small group of persons. I mean, like people love to say we're in a democracy, but it is a republic. It is a group of people that are legislating and ruling over the masses and speaking for the masses. It's not like the democracy, the group of people are always speaking their best interests because they're still battling against being passive and active trying to get them to vote like if this was a functioning democracy you wouldn't have to keep getting people to act democratic to take control because the the flow of society is anything but democratic you want to be told what to do (laughs) i mean people are taught in school to be told what to do everything moves toward employee employer relationship toward class um so toward power um and respecting those who have it um, so i can see that I, I can remember earlier in life thinking about communism but i always thinking well isn't there going to have to be a group that is telling people how to do this and there's still going to have to be guns to force people to comply and if they don't comply are they aren't they still going to go to the same prisons um how is that going to look if it changed like i can't see it looking very different um so i can see that <clears throat> and all this was kind of helping me frame what was going on in society right now, how to see the world right now. Um, ultimately, that's the most I got from it from a financial standpoint. But most of what I got from this book has to do with how I can see the world and relate to people better, <laughs> which is crazy. That wasn't my goal. Um, they revert to pre-Christian savagery and, re- and revive the practice of human sacrifice in order to purge or cleanse society of all persons, classes, and races that do not share their views. This is pre-Christian savagery is what we call that. And and that's what they were doing? Purging? Cleansing society? That's not what the Christians were doing? <laughs> Fact or fallacy? Okay. Um. Let's see. The living authorities. The pharaohs of Egypt, the Roman emperors, and the Japanese mikados were believed to be gods in human form. Until 1911, the empress of China was a sacred being. Now, here you go. Now, we're not studying Egypt. We're not studying Rome. We're not studying Japan. We're not studying China. But let me make these statements about all of those civilizations and you just as a reader assume they're true because i'm on your side now and i know what i'm talking about why why would someone believe that 
Why would someone just believe this stuff? Like, you, that's not your expertise. But you keep throwing in the world. But again, this is how world history is. This is how it's presented, man. Um, so anyway, uh, whenever men began to develop farming and crafts and trades, government stopped them. Really? Did they? Really? I don't believe you, dude. I, I just... I have no reason to believe that statement. It, except to follow your train of thought towards some end that's going to push toward individuality. And that's what I thought about. Like, it's not... Um, it's not about getting people to uh, accept all of this other stuff. It's really about supporting um, all the agendas of individuality, of speaking against these things politically and economically, and all the other history stuff is supposed to just shape you so that you're strong in this stance, so nothing else can really stop you from moving forward. Like, oh, well, not only am do I have individual um, inclinations to fight and to be more independent, to um, seek my own wealth, whatever it is. Um, but I don't trust those other people who did it that way because they their history is backwards. <laughs> you know, so it's a this is the propaganda that the uh, text actually speaks against later on. Efforts to help were based on the false notion that human energy and individual initiative can be directed and controlled through the overriding authority using the brute force of military and police powers. Now, this is like speaking against the police state, right? The federal state um, military and police power. Okay. The false notion that human energy and individual initiative can be directed and controlled. Um, now, again... It's not bringing in slavery. And of course, by this point, I'm thinking now, how will I ever see anything to do with people who look like me in this book? Do I even exist at this point? And again, that's the sadness. It's like, God, I mean, how how do I relate it all to this? OK, <laughs> ding. Thus it is that slave labor has never been able to compete with free men in occupations requiring a high degree of initiative, resourcefulness, and persistence. Now, what a way to bring in slave labor. And, and it's the first time it's, it's brought in, page 58, um, to, to say that it hasn't been able to compete with free men in occupations requiring a high degree of initiative, resourcefulness, and persistence. No to have initiative to be able to be resourceful and persistence come on i mean it takes freedom to do those things man slavery takes all that away man it's just gonna seep it out of you it's just so that was but okay bring in slave labor but i can imagine this text is not going to speak about slavery being bad. I just doubt it because they're just making a comparison about slave labor as opposed to free men. They're not judging one of the other. They're, they're both apparently necessary. All right, let's keep going. Vigilance Committee. In the pioneer days <laughs> of our own Wild West, each man carried a gun. The need for force was rare and few of them ever shot anybody. Oh, so what time is this? This is their, I saw a YouTube video and they said uh, um, regular people uh, or a meal done by regular folks in the 1820s. And I'm like, okay, you meant regular white people, regular European descendants, something, but you didn't mean regular American. Oh, because they said like regular American folk or something like that. And it's like, no, not in 1820. Not in 1820. Um, so similarly here, the need of force was rare. So here's that ignorance that, you know, either on purpose or not conscious or subconscious, um, <clears throat> known or unknown, the need for force was rare and few of them ever shot anybody. So after the government and armies had already sent out people to literally kill and clear the West of Native Americans and run them out and have all of these, I mean, just genocide, genocide. After all of that, then you get this little house on the prairie. You get these uh, guys hanging out like, hmm, it's such a wilderness here. 
Wow, I didn't know America was so was so empty. Wow, few people have ever shot anybody. Cause nobody's coming back from war and telling you the hundreds and thousands. No, we just build a statue for them and say this is one of our great forefathers. And without them, yeah, because they went and killed and killed and killed, and you're able to write down few of them ever shot anybody after the fact. Okay, you know. Um, to do their work in security and peace, they had to get rid of the outlaw. <laughs> so when emergencies arose, they would organize themselves in a vigilance committee, go after the outlaw, and string them up. Now, they're, they're talking about, like, white on white, you know, because these outlaws were equals. These were equals. These weren't slaves that they're talking about, and these weren't Native Americans or American Indians, as they call them in this. No, no, no. They talk about each other, and that's clear. That's clear. Although the Vigilance Committee was created by honest citizens as a means of stopping thieves and murderers, it sometimes resulted in gangsterism. Mm, interesting. No right-thinking person likes the idea of killing. No right-thinking person likes the idea of killing a fellow man. Oh my God. <laughs> you keep the peace. Sheriff, you carry the gun for all of us from now on. You judge, call on 12 of us to decide what to do with any, quote, bad man that the sheriff catches alive. It's your job to preserve law and order so that the rest of us can get our work done without interference. Now, again, I was reading this book not for a history lesson. I was reading it for financial understanding, but it's given me so much more because I see that a lot of things that I read going forward are going to have a similar bend if it's written by people of European descent. Well, regardless of how they're, um, what they look like, who they identify with. But it's important to know what they identify with or what they have lived under being identified, identified as because that's going to be the bias. You know, for me, it's real easy. You know, most of the time, and I've said this before, if they uh, if they don't talk about race or if they don't talk about um, colorism or any of that stuff, they're probably a European descent, probably perceived as white or probably see themselves as white or don't even have to because they're perceived as white most of the time, most often than not. But if it's written more recently, then I can't make that distinction. But if, I mean, written in like 50s, 40s, 30s on back. Absolutely. 100 percent. But nowadays more people are aware and so you you can't make that decision when you're reading their stuff like if it's 2000 or later i don't know i don't know they might well no no <laughs> anyway uh let's keep going it is difficult for americans to understand the stagnating effects of regimentation and i just thought um it's difficult for the americans you're talking about um and how it leads to greater and greater oppressions. It is generally outside the range of our experience because we have lived in a new kind of world where human energy and initiative have usually worked under the natural control of the individual, which is the only way that they can ever work effectively. Now, he's obviously talking to people who have never, who are who are the enslavers, who, who are the ones to put, um, to oppress. He's talking to other oppressors who don't see themselves as oppressors, right? Um, and that's the only way that that can be true. And you think that you're helping them. Um, okay. Stagnating effects of regimentation. Uh, because, yeah, for 160 years, 160 years. So that's, uh, this is 1950, around 1950. So you think uh, 110 18, 10. So he, he basically talking about since like 1776, right? Something like that. For 160 years during the greatest demonstration of progress that the world has ever known. Or 18, 19. Oh, well, really like 1800. Yeah, late 1700. Okay. During the greatest demonstration of progress that the world has ever seen. Each American has been mostly free to decide for himself how to earn money and whether to save or spend it, whether to go to school or to go to work. Now he's saying before slavery ended, each American 
has been mostly free. He's talking about women. <laughs> women and slaves? No, he's not talking about those people at all. He's talking about white people, white men. Each American has been mostly free to decide for himself how to earn money and whether to save or spend it, whether to go to school or to go to work, whether to stick to his job or leave it and get another, or go into business on his own. And there's no mention whether to plant cotton or corn, whether to rent, I mean, there's no mention of how untrue that was for so many people who weren't really considered full Americans. Um, so, you, I mean, it's just important to understand that when people say that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution was not written for them, they're being honest. Okay. <clears throat> um, during the reign of Louis the Fourteenth, uh, let's see, clothes the weavers were waiting for the government to tell them what kind of cloth they would be allowed to weave. So, the, um, yeah, this is just showing how the French, uh, how society in Europe was very similar in the way that um, the masses had to uh, acquiesce and give control over to whoever, the kings and all that. The regulations of the textile industry alone covered over 3,000 pages and they were different for each district. The manufacturers of St. Mon Magnon, for example, had to negotiate for four years before the government allowed them to use black warp, and they did. They never did get permission to use the black warp. So here, I was really trying to grab something from this text because uh, this, this is still a point where I didn't want to think that bad about this stuff, and I was fighting resentment. And then I was like, I, I don't want to be resentful. Um, so yeah, just the three thousand pages of uh, regulations. For the textile industry, I thought about the IRS, you know, and that being the largest codified laws and all of that in the in the nation. So, any attempt to make it work through the use of police force had always failed, and is and has held back civilization. Now, that's easy to say, but in practice, that's not what our society has based was based on. It was created by force. Created. And to say it held back civilization is to ignore our history. So that's what's so hard about this libertarian view is that it's very selective in how it frames what society has has accomplished. And if you ignore slavery and genocide in your analysis of society, then I have to hold that thing up and say, wait, you're not considering all the facts in this thinking. You're just not because how those things have played out and affected where we are uh, really shapes where we're going to go. And and so I can see the same thing in the prison industrial complex and all the prisons and how the same kind of thinking that translates into ignoring slavery has translated into this descendant of enslaved people who is completely ignoring all those people who are incarcerated and does not have not included that in my you know daily internal monologue so yeah it's just helping shape helping shape things but surely human beings all human beings have always wanted food yet for six thousand years they have been hungry and dying of hunger oh my goodness egyptians erected their stately pyramids and sold their daughters to brothels because they could not feed them wait a minute wait a minute how do we jump to they erected stately pyramids and sold their daughters to brothels. Like, wh wh where are you getting this stuff, man? What? Even if it is true, it just doesn't even make sense that you put those two together. Like, you're trying to show how backwards the civilization was? Because that's just crazy. That's just crazy. In Asia and Africa, famines have never ceased. In Europe, the working people have never yet obtained enough milk, butter, fruit. Now, geographically, I don't get that. How are you equating Africa with Europe, this this northern latitude? Like one was able to be agrarian a lot easier. One was forced into a nomadic lifestyle, but that's geography. And of course, they would live in such a way to store up for famine. So I'm not reading about a whole lot of famines. I'm reading about civilization that prospered for cent for thousand for millennia, right? Not famines. They just took them out. 
Um, so it's just hard for me to, I mean, I, I just don't, how, how do you, come on, man. No possible use of physical force can compel anyone to think, speak, or act. It can only limit, hinder, and prevent. Now look at that. Now, of course, you have to think about slavery. No possible use of physical force can compel anyone to think, speak, or act. If you've never seen Roots, check out Roots. And um, remember that one scene with Kunta Kinte and Dave Chappelle made fun of it. What? Your name is Toby. What? Kunta. Kunta Kinte. Wah! Forcing him to say his name. Forcing enslaved people to change their names. Killing them if they spoke their native tongue. Killing them if they practiced their ancient uh, traditions of knowing and of expressing and of worship and of praise. Calling it names. Okay. No possible use of physical force can compel anyone to think, speak, or act. It can only limit, hinder, and prevent. So, that's just like saying, uh, well, no. All right. The fact of the matter is, you don't have to do anything. People don't have to compel you to do nothing. But they'll just kill you. And you watch someone die right in front of you. And you make the decision. Will I just die like them? Or will I live for my family? For my, I'm trying to figure out how to prolong my life the longest. Because obviously I'll kill if I don't comply. I mean, God, man. But I'm not resentful of it. But it hurts. It makes me sad that people can be so ignorant. It makes me sad. And I don't want to be that ignorant. But it's in me too. If you see it in them, see it in yourself too. Government is nothing more than a legal monopoly of the use of physical force by persons upon persons. And the monopoly is uh, permitted by common consent. No government can exist without the consent and economic support of the people. Um, no. No government can exist without the consent of the people. No. Unless you don't call them people. Um unless you kill those who dissent against it and you say you believe it or not. And that's a dictatorship, but that's still a government. That's still a type of government, right? Okay. So, you know, he's making a lot of unqualified statements that just, ugh. Uh, men have killed their rulers and have slaughtered one another in untold millions in the, in the effort to find an authority that would improve their conditions. But the old world revolutions are not real revolutions. They are revolutions only in the sense of a wheel rotating around a motionless center. So again, um, so revolutions, I used to love to talk about circles and how a revolution just returns you to the same point. That's the nature of a revolution, just like a full rotation. But an evolution is something different and or a complete change or transformation, right? So you, you you can evolve, you can transform, or you can digress. And I think that um, those would be better topics, right? To discuss how the world has changed. Because, again, there are so many things to consider about what imperialism and colonialism has done that is not mentioned at all. The massive destruction of, of large swaths of land and resources and species and the effect on its oceans all of these are effects uh, are effects of this globalization of this consumerism of mass production of um, industrialization like those are also the products but to justify the ends to say that we're better off now um, is that ignoring of all of the of the life and that's the big thing about older civilizations is that they considered nature in the way they spoke about the world and everything if they were talking about government they were also talking about the cosmos if they talked about government they were also talking about nature they were also talking about your relationship with your brother like everything was intertwined and now these people are able to talk about um, they separate everything. They divide everything. So it's it's like they can talk about uh, capitalism without talking about the destruction of trees, without talking about the destruction, the, the polluting of lands. They can talk about um, individualism and freedom and ignore that they're enslaving people and having debt slavery and not including, oh, 
it just keeps going. Okay, so you know, no one knows who first made the discovery that men are free. <laughs> what? That was a person who made a discovery? <laughs> The fragmentary records begin with one person. There is no historical proof that he really existed, but the story holds its own self-evident truth and for countless generation, generations was handed down from father to son. They said that when Ur was the great empire about 4,000 years ago, I was like, oh my God, we're back on this Bible history lesson. So another running theme that I'm seeing from the rigid man in Babylon to the, uh, the what was it called? I don't even want to remember the um, Grail Kings. Um, and anyway, there's this running narrative of the Bible stories being absolute historical fact and society starting in Sumer on these clay tablets of cuneiform. Um, and here it is again. So now history, now this book is taking a big turn toward Let's go. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of the world, right? Um, and not necessarily the the whole thing, but all biblical references and quotations in mainspring are from the King James version. Incidentally, I cannot see that it is any sacrilege to observe in passing that Abraham's theological concept laid the foundation for scientific progress. I'm starting to check out mentally now. I'm just like, uh, uh, no. But he's going to be the foundation for scientific progress. Because I'm just thinking that Egypt. I'm just thinking everything that we know about Egypt. But these people may not have known. So here is the the um, Eurocentric white Christian um, propaganda that's been put out in the United States. That, that people are eating up, um, not being taught anything against, feel like there's nothing wrong with it. Here it is. Progress did not come until men began to realize that everything works according to a divine plan, the essence of which is truth and righteousness, says a person who's been talking completely against truth and righteousness for the whole first half of the book. Like, I, I mean, he hasn't been sp speaking about anything divine. And the thing about divinity is that it cuts into everything. So if you have to take divinity out of something and you talk about it, then that thing is is lifeless. It has no spiritual life to it because there was no spirit in it. OK, so now here comes spirit in it. OK, the record says that many years later, during one of the famines, the descendants of Abraham's moved into Egypt in search of food. OK, so they were in a famine, but Egypt was not. All right. He goes into Moses, but 40 years, he kept on telling them that they were free men, that they were responsible for themselves, but slaves, um, wait a minute, but slaves are passive. They submit, they obey, and they expect to be fed. You hear that? So here's that narrative talking about slaves and just like in the, um, um, rigid man in Babylon, he speaks the same way about slaves, just his negative this negative affiliation with slaves as if they are something is inherent about them right they wanted Moses to be their king so that they could hold him responsible and blame him for everything but Moses turned them down and kept on insisting that they were free and responsible for themselves so that is to say that the slaves because that's how they you know not people who are enslaved no when they teach about slavery they teach that a slave is a is a is a creature in and of itself, right? Um, so I, I compared that to the criminal. That person is no longer a human. They are a criminal, and they should be treated as such. No longer do they have the same capacity as a normal person anymore. They're 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 different than a normal person. They're their own thing. They're a criminal, and they feel it every time somebody talks to them. Like you talking to me like I'm a criminal, but I'm just like you. You talking to me like I'm a slave, but I'm just like you. You talk to me like I'm less than you, but I'm just like you. But you can't tell them that. And it's so subconscious that people can do it and completely hold themselves faultless, man. And, you know, this is what discrimination and pressure feels like. Women can say the same thing. Women can say, you know, you think I'm less than you talk, you talk down to me. And they speak about that, too. But anyway, uh, this was just it was just sad to read because if I'm in history class and we're going over this book. Who am I unless it's predominant people who look like me and we wouldn't be reading the book in that case. But if I'm in a 
classroom and I'm like one of, of three out of like 20 people who look like me and I say man this is just offensive do you guys hear how sad that is some might say yeah but let's not talk about that that's not uh, and that's that's why I'm glad to be able to read and talk about this because uh, I don't have to be in the spaces where this is indoctrinated upon me thank the Lord finally as a result Moses reduced the teachings of Abraham to a written code of moral law Known as the Ten Commandments, it stands today as the first and greatest document of individual freedom in the recorded history of man. Whew. Let's go, Christianity. Way to go, because nothing else existed. And even though the facts are there, you don't want to believe it. <laughs> you don't want to look at it. Oh, man. I'm sorry, Mom. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's a true, true home story. You know, like I can't talk about this kind of stuff about Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Book of Coming Forth Day by Night, uh, Isis, Osiris, Horus, all of the parallels, the flood stories. I can't talk about all that stuff because uh, it's against the narrative that's been force fed for centuries. Um, it just doesn't sit. Mm -mm, can't talk about that. You're not even in class with these people. You're not even at work with these people who force this on you. But you still can't talk about it. You know, that was me just a few months ago. Shit. The ancient Israelites wanted a king rather than a code of personal conduct. Oh, that is a precise statement of the sources of a state's power and of the results of a state's attempt to control the subject in their ancient or modern times. Um, I don't know about that one the new commandment although he has he was followed by multitudes don't although he was followed by multitudes there were few who understood the full import of his teachings um to my jesus so relatively speaking the foundations of the hebrew christian religion are of modern origin out of context i can't really speak on that one paradoxically when not kept within bounds, the democratic process has always led to the destruction of democratic ideals and has served as a springboard to dictatorship and war. I agree. I agree. That's what it seems like because I can't look to any, uh, I can't look to us for a model of success when it comes to the democratic process. But also, as, as Eurocentric as this is, only speaking about, all right, so we started at the beginning of time and we went from, this is funny, um, from Jesus and stuff to Rome to the Greeks. Now we're on the Greeks. So a big part of uh, getting outside of this thinking and seeing everything from a new set of eyes is like, um, I can't even help myself sometimes to keep going back to talking about Greece, Rome, Egypt, and the United States without talking about Canada or South America or Thailand or India or China or Hawaii or Australia. Like all those other ones, I don't even go to off the top. So I don't even make the comparison that should be made in a global context. I'm still trying to get out of this Eurocentric model, right? That's how pervasive it is. <clears throat> Okay. No government can support its people for the simple reason that a government must der derive its support from the people. That's just. Uh, yeah. It goes back to the same things that um, the other book talked about. That yes, uh, you're giving government the power that it's ultimately going to use to rule over you. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay. As we will. As, we, as will be seen later, the political structure of the United States is radically different from that of the Greeks or the Romans. It is based on the Ten Commandments and on the teachings of Christ. Try to rewrite the Declaration of Independence without reference to the Christian axioms. You'll find it can't be done. I thought, how crazy of a statement is that? Um, not going to refute all this stuff because it's just nonsense. While Europe was still stagnating in the Dark Ages in several countries before Britain had its Magna Carta, a dynamic but little-known civilization based on a recognition of personal freedom was blazing in the Near East and spreading along the shores of the Mediterranean. Now, all of a sudden, because now again, remember, it was talking about barbarism, like 
outside of what we've done most recently, we would revert back to barbarism in our civilization. Now he's saying that there was a civilization that was blazing in the Near East. Now, what does he really mean? He means like Northeast Africa. I already saw this coming. Now, we've already talked all about America with no mention, no mention of the people who were formerly enslaved, no mention of minorities, barely any mention of women. I think they may have said something about a woman, but just this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. You're just ignored. Ignored. The second attempt. Um, Babylon was long forgotten and the Roman Emperor had ceased to exist. Europe sunk in the barbarism of the Dark Ages was less important than Africa is today. So here's the first mention of Africa. And it says that um, Europe was less important than Africa is today. Hmm. Constant. Constantinople, surrounded by the thriving cities of Baghdad, Damascus, Antioch, Alexandria, had become the center of world trade. So he's talking all about North Africa and into the Mediterranean area. So, but but Africa isn't important. Now he's going to preface start with that, and then we're going to go to these cities in Africa that are the centers of world trade. Okay, <laughs> it's oh man. <clears throat> And this is when I started to get pretty sad, but at the same time, not resentful. In the deserts and the mountains and the steamy, fertile river valleys from the Ganges to the Atlantic. The Ganges is uh, south, um, southern uh, Spain, I want to say. I had to look it up, but now I can't remember. These people were of all races and colors and classes, all creeds, all former cultures, all former empires. They included Buddhists, Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus. Uh, Mongolians, Chaldeans, Assyrians, Armenians, Persians, Medes, Arabs, Greeks. Now listen to this. Egyptians, Phoenicians, Hittites, Africans, and hundreds of others whose ancient ancestors have worn the soil to dust before the early stone history. Now it's important because this is how they do it. This is how they do it. Um, so now remember when you, when you talk about America, when we were talking about Americans, even before um, America was officially, you know, declaration, you don't hear um, Germans, Austrians, the Polish, Scottish, Irish, um, nomadic. Tri I mean, what you don't hear all that, right? You don't. You don't hear all that. You just hear us. We. We from Europe, all of us, we're all we're all the same. Now, you get over here in this North African Near East context. Now, what do they say? They break down. People were of all races and colors and classes. They're saying they're dark. That is as simple as that. These are dark skinned people, but we're going to they're just not all together because we can't group them together the way we group ourselves together. Them of darker shades. We have to split them up countless times, but us who also have different shades, but we're going to just throw ourselves into this European white category. We're all together. So this is, I mean, it's as clear as day, man. <laughs> it's as clear as day. Uh, and just to go back a little bit, school books lay great emphasis on European history, ancient and modern, but no point is made of the fact that when Europe was stagnating in the so-called Dark Ages, the world was actually bright with a civilization more closely akin to what we have seen in America than anything that had gone before. So we, okay, what is it? Uh, school books lay great emphasis on European history. No, 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 no. American school books. Eurocentric school books and then they're going to continue to do that through the rest of the thing but when we talk about these cultures okay so anyway that was the first time that they mentioned Africans right first time they mentioned Africans and Africans are their own group as opposed to all these other peoples who are living in Africa right because they're just not going to do that they just could not do that then and hundreds of others uh, are mm, wait a minute is there any more Okay, I got to read this little line right there. There is no name that correctly applies to all of these people. Uh-huh. The Europeans, because we're going to call all of them in Europe, 
in that area, we're going to group them as Europeans who hated them, called them Saracens. Now, I had to look up Saracens because this is my first time ever hearing that. Now, yes, you're, you're talking about, and this was a term that they were using um, for the people in the uh, uh, Northeast Africa, but also um, it had to do with people of the Muslim faith, right? And then you also had the Moors and the way they tell the story is that the Saracens um, went into Spain and was like conquering Spain. But that made me think about all the stories I heard about the African um, domination of Spain uh, for centuries. And I was like, well, what about the Moors? Because the Moors were over there. They don't mention any of them. They don't say one word about Moors in here, but it's just Saracens. So you hear this kind of, you know, what they would term like whitewashing, but it's just Eurocentric. Um, we will never group all the Africans into one category. Um, it's just that kind of thing. So anyway, this chapter is based mainly on information gathered by Rose Wilder Lane, whose researches include personal contacts among remnants of former Saracenic tribes. So Saracenic tribes, where, where is Saracen? Where is it? Oh, oh, but Europeans, like the hypocrisy of labeling, again, things you just won't hear when you're reading a book like this, because it's not up for debate. The only thing, uh, okay, priceless zero. Having established the concept of zero, the Saracens proceeded to develop arithmetic. Now we know now all about arithmetic. Then they added algebra, including quadratics. Now we know Okay, to Euclid's geometry, they added plane and spherical geometry and trigonometry. Now we know where these things started. Applying these to the sun, moon, and stars, they produced astronomy. Now we know where astronomy started. They built ob ob observatories across three continents, studied the heavens, recorded their observations, and put them into practical use. The Saracens. Just can't call them Africans, man. Um, anyway, not that it would matter at any point. I mean, at least you're not giving yourself the credit for it or whatever. But you can't let those people who look like those Africans, um, you can't relate them to one another. And that's going to that's going to come up. That's, that's the whole point of this, is that there's a separation. There's a very intentional separation. But not like... So when you think about the criminal and uh, of the viewpoint of me having this kind of negative view of the criminal and say, I'm like, that's a criminal. That's not a person anymore. That's a criminal. Then I don't, to justify my own thinking on that, I would then say that somebody else who murdered the same way that this criminal murdered, I'm going to put some other label associate with that murder because I have to justify it in my mind. I have to rationalize it in my mind. Now, me being one who has experienced racism, I would think that that rationalization was something against me. That was something that they were doing actively against me. They wanted to degrade me. They wanted to make me feel a certain way. But seeing myself in them, I see how the same way that I would put, um, say my mom had to kill my neighbor to protect me. Um, I'm not gonna call her a m murderer the same way I'm gonna call this criminal a murderer because that criminal is not human the same way they are a criminal my mom is my mother and she was doing something great for me but she's not a criminal no that's those people right uh creating a different narrative has nothing to do with that criminal it has to do with me feeling okay with what's going on in my head so uh so that's how i see this i say all that to say that i don't resent them for their ignorance but um, if they stay ignorant, that's on them. If I keep calling somebody a criminal and I don't treat them like a human being, that's on me. And I'm going to pay for that. Um, and that's what I feel like. People who stay ignorant in racism. <sighs> yeah. The fanatic Europeans looked upon them as followers of the Antichrist, the mystic body of Satan on earth, and the Saracens regarded the Europeans as crude barbarians. Now remember, they already said that the Europeans hated them. And uh, 
what they're really saying is um they hated the Africans. Uh, let's see, what was it? Um, okay. In Spain, at Cordova, Granada, and Seville, the Saracens built great centers of learnings and art, science, production, and commerce from India and Africa and Cathay. Students came to the universities in Spain, and from Spain, students went to universities in Cairo, Baghdad, and Delhi. So it's really, really talking about the African presence in Spain for, you know, centuries. Okay, getting to the Crusades. You know, nothing's else going on across the world because this is supposed to be world history, but it only is world history in regards to northeastern Africa, northern Africa, Spain, and Europe. That is your world history. That is it right here. Okay. It was the Europeans who had the habit of starting wars. It was the Europeans who massacred heretics down to the last infant. I was like, wow, thank you for being honest and self-critical for one sentence in this 200 and some pages. Um, the most amazing thing to the Crusaders, however, must have been the cleanliness. It seemed that everyone was always bathing. So here we are. Now you're learning right here because we're talking about the Saracenic. And, and it's something that John Henry Clark would talk about, you know, um, that if you're reading these, I think it was him. It might have been Ivan Van Sertima or Dr. Ben. One of those three said it. How they can't help telling on themselves in history, even when they're trying not to. So here, they're speaking about how clean the Africans were. Their African cultures were about cleanliness. And they were bringing that into Spain when Europe didn't take baths. And it says it over and over again. Um, but it's the Saracens, which I bet I had never heard of. <laughs> Our bodies are clothed with things that the Saracens began to create a thousand years ago. Okay, now we're getting credit to African civilization without saying it was African civilization. The Saracens were fierce in battle, but they were not cruel. They did not kill the wounded. They did not torture their prisoners. When they struck down an, op an opponent, it was not uncommon to help them up, to help them up. Read Sir Walter Scott. They did not persecute Christians. They were honorable. They told the truth. They kept their word. Okay. To white Africans. Although hundreds of books have been written on the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans, so far as I can discover, no historical analyst has ever developed a realistic account of the rise and fall of the Saracenic civilization. Because you just made up the, the freaking Saracenic word that you're talking about Africans that were then moving a little bit more east were then mixing with people in India and in the Mediterranean and create another civilization after the, the rise and fall of the African civilization along the Nile and below in Sudan. Like, stop it, man. Stop it. No realistic account. You're not looking for one either. You're not looking for one. Stop it. But that's to say, don't waste your time looking for this history because you're probably not going to find it. That's what they're saying. Like, now that we've, you know, sprinkled a little bit of truth about what was going on in this, uh, <laughs> in, in this civilization in Spain and in, uh, in Africa, don't look for any other books because you won't find them. Important lessons. Uh, talks a lot about Muslims. The Saracens had no police force. Yeah, I know. Okay, um, third attempt. Prelude to third attempt. So what are all these attempts? So these are all attempts toward human progress, right? Um, things dragged along for almost a decade until January 1492 when the last of the Saracenic strongholds fell. It was the beautiful city of Granada, the great center of learning, science, art, architecture, and commerce, which the Saracens had been creating for 800 years. So these were the Moors as well, right? So these are Africans there. And so it falls, okay? 1492, he's getting up to, um, he's getting up to, uh, Columbus. And at this point, I was like, I'm not even expecting to get much more about finances because I didn't know this was going to be a history book written by somebody who worked at General Motors. Like, what? Um, okay. Pre Columbus voyages. Uh, yes, America had been discovered any number of times prior to 1492, but that's no discredit to Columbus. You know, Daniel Tosh was the first person in my lifetime that I heard who would be identified as white or who does identify as white, who critiqued Columbus. And that's when I knew that, you know, I was living in a 
pretty good time of expression because I had always felt that, but man, finally people were saying it on a big stage and people were laughing about it. It's like, thank God we're getting there. But still, there are a lot of Columbus supporters, man, because they've been indoctrinated just like this for generations. No discredit to Columbus. Among the Saracens, it was common knowledge that the earth is round. They had taken the theories of Aristotle and other Greek philosophers, reduced them to scientific observations, and applied their findings to the practical problems of navigation. The Saracens' the knowledge of astronomy had been passed along to the European scholars and was generally accepted by them, although they had to be cautious in expressing their views. So, you got these people from, you know, okay. It's such heretical doctrines had to be suppressed. That's why Roger Bacon, the 13th century father of modern science, spent his life. Um, that is why the, the discreet friends of Copernicus published his discoveries as mere mathematical abstractions. That's why the less discreet, the more outspoken, the downright rambunctious Galileo fell into the hands of the inquisitors and escaped torture only by retracting his statements. I thought that was cool. Okay. <clears throat> Himself a devout Christian and student of the scriptures, Columbus loved to apply the sacred scriptures to his own life and adventures. God, they painted this dude as such a great person. While on his third voyage, he was a victim of a whispering campaign which charged him with mismanagement of the Hispaniola colony. Now, we're not talking anything about what was going on in that colony, but mismanagement. Now, by the way, there is plenty of literature on Columbus and the way that he treated the people there and what he was doing and why he had to be charged with stuff. But that's not a part of this narrative because we have to escalate these men. We have to, it's, you know, elevate whatever the word is. Um, magnetic compass developed by the Saracens. And I didn't know that. The maps and navigation charts used by Columbus were also based on information supplied by the Saracens. Um, <clears throat> no time for theory. Tortured, slaughtered, burned alive in their blazing houses or rounded up when they fled, the surviving Muslims were converted. But they continued to follow their heathen customs, reading their Arabic books, playing their athletic games, wearing their silk robes, and bathing, always bathing. It's just the way they talk about this. Now, now you're talking about people being tortured, slaughtered, and burned, right? But you're treating these people like people. They were tortured, slaughtered, and burned. But, n okay, see if you hear anything else about that. Okay, the Morisco. So when I saw that, I was thinking of people from from Morocco. Um, anyway, she thought it was interesting. Beaten, robbed, murdered, or dying of hunger and thirst along the way, few of them lived to reach Africa, and so far as known, none was left alive and slain. So we're talking about the Saracens again. Spain had been cleansed. It had accepted the European ideology. Its people were now united in one common belief, the belief that an authority controlled their lives and would henceforth be responsible for their welfare now this is said in the context of like this was a bad thing because the Europeans were warping their thinking saying that they had something good from Africa and then now uh, they were under the belief that an authority controlled their lives and would henceforth be responsible um, you know it's kind of like that um, male personification of God, him, he, his will. Um, three generations from grandfather to grandson. Uh, the concept of individual freedom was all but forgotten. All but forgotten. But across the sea, a new civilization was in the making, a civilization more close to resembling that of the Saracens than anything which had gone before. 100,000% incorrect. The civilization that was being brought over to America across the sea, what would soon be America, was exactly the same kind of civilization that was pushing out of the Saracens. It was imperialism. We're talking about the beginning of imperialism. We're talking about producing guns, making as many guns as we can, killing people on a massive scale and taking their land by the hundreds, thousands, millions non-stop here is the outset so for them to say a new civilization was in the making nah man nah nah 
A third attempt. Fewer than 3 million persons lived in scattered settlements along the Atlantic coast from Labrador to New Spain, the Floridas. They were of all races, colors, ancestries, and creeds. The French were in the North and in the Carolinas. No mention of slavery. Let's keep going. Now, listen to this. Oh, man. Mingled with all these were Italian, Portuguese, Finns, Arab, Armenians, Russians, Greeks, and Negroes from dozens of different African tribes and cultures. Now, Negroes from African tribes and cultures. We're talking about Africans, but we've already separated Africans from Negroes, from being at least maybe, maybe they were trying to say that African tribes and cultures were actual people, but we're gonna put these Negroes in a separate category from African tribes and cultures. Why would you do that? Like, would you say, I mean, that's like saying, that's like saying slaves from Greece. Like, these are not Greeks. These are slaves from Greece or, or, um, I mean, it's just, you, you're, oh, so anyway, that stuck out because that was the first and only time they mentioned the word Negro or the word, um, or African tribes and cultures. That was the first time, only time. So, oh no, I didn't. Um, in all groups and classes, there was intermarriage with the American Indians in the, interest of historical perspective it is important to remember that during more than half of our history america was a conglomeration of colonial settlements subservient to european powers and without any government of its own in the interest of historical perspective that's why i had to highlight it it is important to remember so in the interest of of historical perspective it's not important to mention how these Negroes from dozens of different African tribes and cultures got there or who was in America before these colonial settlements or how they became colonial settlements. All that is not important in this historical perspective. Um, along the same pattern, the kings of France later established snug little settlements along the St. Lawrence. <laughs> snug little settlements. That's why I had to highlight that. Then around the Great Lakes and down the Mississippi River to New Orleans and Mobile. Then up the Ohio River. So, Aristotle, aristocratic ladies and gentlemen, perfumed and jeweled, bewigged, powdered and matched, were carried by slaves in satin line sedan chairs to 12 night balls while happy villagers, fatter than any in Europe, crowded outside the windows to watch the gaiety. There's your mention of slaves. Uh, let's see. The next group was left stranded for almost three years, and when the supply ship finally arrived, the settlers had vanished. Just what had happened to them is a mystery. So uh, maybe they were killed by the indigenous Americans for staying there. But again, I was really trying to focus on the finances. Like, what am I supposed to be learning about the way things move financially and um, any kind of gain in perspective when it comes to money? <clears throat> A few gentlemen obtaining a colonization permit through a political pool and agreeing to share their profits with the crown, so that's like taxes, would organize a trading company at their own expense. So, talks about this trading company. And there were shiploads of women who were auctioned off at the ports to settlers in need of wives. So you, you see, talk about sex trafficking. Here, here's the start of sex trafficking. There were shiploads of women who were auctioned off at the ports to settlers in need of wives. Wives are like property, right? Let's sell them off. Um, very interesting. These were times when even a gentleman had to work or starve. Even a gentleman had to work. The only source of wealth is human energy attacking this earth. Um, I'm about done. The Carolina region was successfully colonized in the 1650s by people who moved down from Virginia and Pennsylvania, specializing in turpentine and tar that got along splendidly. This colony would be set up as a grand model of an idea of political structure and would include all the complexities of European feudalism. Uh, progress was at a standstill until the early 1700s when the Lord proprietors passed out of the picture and the Carolinas were set up as two separate colonies. From then on, they were left pretty much in charge of their own affairs and they grew and prospered. Now there is no mention again of the hypocrisy of this model. And this to me is the big 
thing about this individual freedom and they're talking about individual freedom and liberty without ever addressing slavery which uh just blows my mind how do you it's crazy it's crazy although head of britain's most prosperous slave trading corporation oglethorpe was a humanitarian at heart his heart was as big as all outdoors, and his desire to do good to his fellow man overshadowed all of his other interests. And that's how we talk about slave traders, slave owners, landowners, um, the men who beat their wives, who uh, everything that was atrocious to other human beings. We paint them with a brush of humanitarianism that is just not used toward any other group of people. And it, it just needs to be said over and over again so people don't don't fall into that, man. I mean, but it's not like a lot of people watching my channel, but I'm telling you, man. He wanted to give the soldiers and sailors a better deal. He was worried about the price of coal. He wanted to provide refuge and relief for the persecuted Protestants of Europe. He spearheaded the agitation for English prison reforms and fought to abolish the stupid law under which decent and industrious people could be thrown into jail for small debt. So I think this was the point when I realized about crime and how I was perpetuating the same thing. Like I could be fighting for prison reform, but I'm not. And But they're saying that here's a, a, a prosperous slave trader, a slave trader who is fighting for prison reform. So they're showing how great and humanitarian he was through his prison reform work, though he d never speaks out about slavery, right? Um, so it's those kind of things. A man of great energy and action. Anyway, I never care much about him though. The social aspects would also be carefully supervised. Slaves, rum, and Roman Catholics would be strictly prohibited. Uh, Yeah, so he's talking about setting up society. Um, but as I said before, the historians are inclined to stress the war aspects and overlook the lessons that might be learned as bearing on the problems of peace and progress. So this is counter to what they're saying they're presenting. Now, other historians are inclined to stress the war aspects and overlook the lessons that might be learned. So as opposed to that, they're just... Uh, inclined to stress the European eccentricity, the European excellence, the European viewpoint, while overlooking the rest of the world and the atrocities committed by said Europeans. So we're just not going to talk about the war part, but everything else about us, it's great. So let's just talk about that and not about the rest of the world. Roots of, of Revolution. Charles II signed an act permitting the American colonists to ship cotton, lumber, tobacco, and other products to England, but only to England. It was true that such products were needed in England. Most of them were already going there, but it was also true that the colonists needed sugar and molasses from the West Indies. So we need all the... Pro uh, all of this has to do with the slave trade, but we're not going to mention slave trade. All of this is slave trade, Im imperialism, colonialism, slave trade. Here it is. But we're not going to speak about any of those three terms. The reality of all the death surrounding the making of the tobacco and the other products that are sent to England, nor the West Indies and their fights for independence and how it was atrocious. None of that is of any importance. We're just talking about needing the sugar and the molasses. Um, the desperate islanders were ready to sell their products for anything they could get. Traffic in molasses, sugar, and rum had become the backbone of their business. Slave labor, slavery, and capitalism was the backbone of their business. So, duh, right? Their prosperity depended on the West Indies trade. By this time, conditions in America paralleled the prohibition area of the era of the 1920s. People were losing respect for legal authority. The law was a joke and everyone enjoyed breaking it. So this reminds me of reading, you know, the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and relating that to uh, abolition. And shortly after it was repealed in the 30s, you know, that's when the big book was written by people who said that, you know, we got to get back to it. I got to get back to God and we got to show people how to get out of this thing. I'm an alcoholic, you know, but 
Meanwhile, this is over 100 years after the fact, maybe 200 years after the fact, they were selling alcohol to the indigenous, um, to the indigenous Americas, <laughs> to the indigenous Americans, to to get them to lose all the all of the vices that alcohol creates, all the problems it creates. They were glad to give it to indigenous Americans. And uh, that helped with their domination, you know. Anyway, that was a digression. Most of the colonists remembered grandfathers, even fathers who had risked their lives to read the Bible. They knew of men who had been burned at the stake, wrenched joint from joint on the rack, broken on the wheel for saying or even for being accused of saying that ordinary men have the right to read the Bible. They're talking about colonists. They're talking about themselves. Now, the fact that this was going on with slaves didn't matter and that it was going to... And it was going on with slaves that day. But they're talking about colonists who remember their grandfathers, even their fathers who had risked their lives. No, but they're still killing slaves. Now, if they would do that to their own, imagine what they were doing to those who were enslaved. Burning at the stake? Yep. Wrench joint from joint on the rack? Yep. Broken on the wheel? Yep. I mean... But we're not talking about them because that's not important to this conversation, to this historical perspective. I just was like, oh, my God, this is this is a uh, this is a textbook I would have read, man. Both governments were seeking allies among the Indians. Both sides bribed them with fire water. So that's the alcohol. Both sides armed them with weapons. Both sides paid liberally for scalps. So the red men set fire to the white men's cabins. Settlers on both sides were scalped or burned at the stake. Their wives were taken as squaws and their children grew up as Indians. And that's a very one-sided argument. Because these same people who were um, making treaties with the Indians were then going back and killing those Indians and forcing them further and further west. Like it wasn't a, <laughs> it wasn't one-sided. The Indians were bad. We, we, we tried to be with them, but then they just turned on us. So we had to kill him. <laughs> it's sad. Oh, man. He set about to regulate both and to provide British shipping with a triangular voyage from England, the American ports, and the West Indies. So you don't hear slave trade in 1950. It's triangular voyage between England, the American ports, and West Indies. The colonists had grown tired of being the pawns of old world bureaucracy. Uh, natural job of applying their energies to the production of goods and services. Nothing on earth is more valuable than the person who knows that all men are free and who accepts the responsibilities that go with freedom. Okay. Um, I think I was trying to get to the Civil Yeah, let me just read you what they say about the Civil War. Because it just keeps going. The Republic... But the United States did not come into being until June 1788, at which time the federal constitution had been accepted by nine states, but only on the condition that it be amended to include certain specific restrictions and reservations to provide the individual against the improper use of force and to prevent central government from encroaching on the rights of state governments. Um, so here I began to see how these arguments can be framed when it's been framed the entire way with no regard to people who are enslaved, no regard to minorities, no regards to women's rights, no regards to the Native Americans, no regards to any other cultures. And we're talking now about the formation of our government. OK, for the first time in history, the right to own property was to be given full legal legal recognition and was to be extended to the humblest citizen without regardless to class distinction, close social position or status of birth again this only makes sense it only even makes sense for me in thinking about those who were enslaved and formerly enslaved as criminals once a criminal always a criminal once a slave always a slave there is no way i can help you i'm sorry to happen to you but that is not my struggle that's yours good luck with that so with that kind of mindset i can then address this issue of states rights and federal rights right that's the only way i can do it because otherwise i'm stuck in this resent where in this resentment where i don't want to talk about what you're talking about i want you to feel me i want you to feel me right but uh so leaving that out 
unable to see this a little clear. Canada had remained loyal to the king. Spain still held the Floridas, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. France, France owned most of the territory between the Mississippi and the Rocky Mountains. Russia was in the extreme northwest. So here you have uh, speaking about where the power is lying with, the, with different uh, areas in what is now United States by these other European nations. Um, so how people were really feeling like, you know, we need to limit government. It started to make sense. In the 1860s, Americans fought to abolish slavery once and for all. At least that's usually, uh, that's, at least that's usually thought of as the cause of the war between the states. And it was a just cause, except that the problem of freeing the slaves was already well on the way toward a peaceful solution. Now, but the real issue was the matter of states rights versus federal domination. Now, there is no explanation there as to how these how the problem of freeing the slaves was on its way toward a peaceful solution, because the only thing that even resembled that was runaway slaves in which they enacted laws to stop them from doing abolitionists who would work with the Underground Railroad. All of this was going on underneath the law. So toward a peaceful solution is like saying um, the abolition of uh, or the repeal of the abolition of alcohol was on its way toward a peaceful repealing in that everyone was breaking the law until finally the government stepped in and said you know well let's just repeal it so that's the song that everybody was going to keep breaking laws and and not be punished when they were so so the difference with uh, alcohol is that those who were supposed to be enforcing the laws, they were also breaking the law, right? So there's that corruption. We can't sustain it. But when it comes to slavery, no, nah. those who were enforcing the laws were enforcing the law. There were going to be few, if any, who weren't going to be enforcing the laws because they were being incentivized to enforce the laws. They were getting paid to catch these slaves, rewards for this. So it's like, how was it moving toward a peaceful solution? That's the question. If it wasn't about slavery, um, well, that's not really the argument that it wasn't about slavery, but they said that it was on its way toward a peaceful revolution. But that aside, the real issue was the matter of states' rights versus federal domination. Now, this involved the tariff question, which has long been the backbone of contention between the industrial states and the agricultural states. Industrial states in the north, agricultural states in the south. The latter, the agricultural states, had for many years been fighting against high tariffs because they violated the principle of no special privileges for anyone. So that made sense to me. That made a lot of sense. Tariffs. And basically the north was getting by with lower tariffs than um, in the industrial states than in the agricultural states. So from the economic standpoint, this is like white on white balance. They're just, um, I want to be treated equally as you um, economically, right? So that's interesting. That's that's interesting. And I can see uh, those rights and I want to give the government those rights. I can see that. Um, but the argument that people have now that I've been a part of, man, of like trying to push the narrative about what the Civil War was about is like the criminal trying to make people see him as a human. It just don't work that way. It just don't work. It don't work. Um, but it's up to the individual to see, to not be blinded that way. Um, anyway, at any rate, the slaves were freed and the Declaration of Independence was applied to all. <laughs> America's attempts to support the cause of freedom in other lands have partially atoned for our early lapses into old world tyranny. What? Now you have some old world lapses into tyranny that we haven't discussed. Anyway, but our support would be far more productive if we would do a better job of sowing the seed instead of merely don donating the fruit. Um, I don't know if there's anything else good. The colonial woman gathered her own firewood and cooked over an open fire just as women have cooked since the dawn of history. And just as more than two thirds of the women on earth are cooking today, saying that the woman's place is in the kitchen. I thought that was funny. Um, uh, I think that's it, man. So, yeah, I didn't get. Well, here's a little green one. 
When a people won a war, they made slaves of the defeated people. If they lost, they became slaves of their conquerors. In either case, there was always a surplus of burden bearers. Long hours of drudgery helped to keep slaves submissive, so there was no incentive to develop labor-saving techniques. No point in worrying about time. Now, this goes counter to what they said at the beginning about those three things of the free person and not speaking about what happens to enslaved people but now they're showing how the ends were justifying the means um okay and it just gets into individual okay one of the best ways to ensure future progress is keep clearly in mind the things which have been responsible for our past progress as well as the things which may have kept America from being as great <laughs> as it might have been. Um, so a lot of convenient amnesia in that one. Lumber was plentiful. The bottleneck was nailed. So now it gets into mass production. Um, it talks about Eli Whitney. Um, the principle of individual liberty and freedom, the principle that each person controls his own life energy and is responsible for his own acts and for his relationships with others. Uh, yeah. Hope versus fear. This is basically in. Okay. Last quote. We've been free to choose our own jobs and free to compete with one another for better jobs without any overriding authority dictating to us as to where we should work, what we should be paid, and how we should spend it. No, we have not. He is talking to a very select few, and that is one of the most inconsiderate, inaccurate statements in American history right there. Um, so that's it. Um, that's the book. I'm um, going to read now um, some Howard French uh, about China and Africa. I was looking through the bibliography to read more of his recommended readings from the Become Your Own Bank Nelson Nash, but I saw a lot of this similar being that um, one, the texts were all written you know, way back and uh, it's the biases that are exhibited um, make it more of a strain to filter through a lot of the nonsense to look for little tidbits so I realized that um, what made this book great for me is that I was approaching something on purpose I had a very clear purpose in mind as to what I wanted to um, gain from the book. And because of that, I was able to let go of resentment, which is something I haven't been able to do for a long time. Um, and it just gave me power to realize that um, in focus and con in very concrete terms and very um, intentional action, um, it's possible to free yourself from the burden of that kind of racism because um, now I'm finally evolving out of that I mean it's, it's been hard because learning the facts has been one part and then the second part is being able to sit with the facts in this reality and relate to people effectively and still see everyone as an equal and not as something else to not see, see other people as something else but to see myself in other people um, and this book helped me to do that in a roundabout way it helped me to see myself and other people um regardless of what they done who they are all that stuff uh so it was good for that um more of some material i guess i'll read this last quote um the third attempt to set men free has been made the great grandchildren of the revolution no just attempt to set men free in the midst of all that slavery here in America, after 160 years of voluntary cooperation between free individuals, <laughs> this is not made up. They wrote this down and they meant it. We have pointed the way to a world of peace and plenty. After 160 years of voluntary cooperation between free individuals, he's talking about before slavery was abolished. Oh, man. Okay. Um,. All right, last thing in, in here, because this is literally the last page. And America always plays the major role in helping his friends as well as his enemies to get back on their feet. But there are definite limits to how far we can go in that direction. Perhaps we should be doing the peoples of the world a greater and more enduring service. If along with each item of food, clothing, money, and equipment, we send a simple matter-of-fact statement 
of the reasons underlying our ability to make in, uh, contributions which are so far out of proportion to our population and our natural resources. That's like saying, um, here's a gift for you. Um, Merry Christmas. By the way, I got this by stealing, killing, and making sure that I dominate wherever I go. You should try sometime. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Keep reading. Uh, Howard French is next. I am on a reading mission, so I'm going to be getting it done. All right. Later.